it's the hero show welcome to the hero show everybody starring the unwavering john hersey and the irrepressible andrew bernstein i am andrew bernstein and you are indubitably john hersey how you doing this morning john i'm doing great how are you doing today andy I'm doing great also. We have a real American hero to discuss, although certainly uh, he's flawed and we'll discuss his flaws. And part of the reason I'm great is because, you know, my colleague here is such a manly looking guy, growing a beard and everything. All the, <laughs> gotta, you know, his wife has to fight off his all the lady friends and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure doing business with you, John. Yeah, if you're if you're seeing this on YouTube, then uh, it's the debut of the beard on the Hero Show. Thanks, Andy. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's very it's very manly, and you know, and 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 today in our you know, in our day of political correctness and cancel culture and everything, when you know manliness is under attack. What did Clint Eastwood say? Who's like 90 years old now? We should do a Hero Show episode on Clint, by the way. <laughs> And, and dirty Harry, but he said something like, "Every generation is becoming, you know, regressively less less masculine, or or, or something." Well, mm. you well, you know, that's a sad. If that's true, and I, I suspect there is some truth to it, it's a sad, it's a sad truth. But you and I don't have that problem. The testosterone just oozes out out of us, right? And you know, manliness is is ubiquitous and part of which we should always point out when we get to thomas jefferson uh part of being a man of course as we point out is to be a gentleman and treat a lady with respect we always have to you know always have to say that so many guys seem to think that you know women are just uh, you know second class citizens that they can push around and you know and, and treat uh you know treat horribly so you and i know no better about about what it really means to be a man don't we we could pat ourselves on Absolutely. the back about that. <laughs> pat Respect. On. Yeah, you, you not only have to get out there and chop some wood, you know, uh, grow your beard out once in a while, but yeah, respect. Ladies first, you got to open the doors. You, you've got to be yeah. a good guy. And uh, yeah. Right. Absolutely. That, that, no, that's right. You know, I, and there are, you know, uh, what, strident feminists who think that opening the door for a lady is, you know, is, is some kind of, you know, condescending patronizing attitude that's the bunk you know i mean i mean and i think most women appreciate that she's being treated with a great deal of respect she's been being treated like a lady i think most women are sufficiently rational to uh, to appreciate that and i'm guessing thomas jefferson uh what <laughs> to bring it back to where to where we where we are today that thomas jefferson a virginia aristocrat uh was was a gentleman in, in treating the ladies would be my guess yeah, he certainly and grew up is. among the Virginia gentry and, and learned early on uh, you know, the, just the, the forms of, of civil, being civil. You know, he, he uh, grew up in a pretty wealthy family and uh, started school when he was five, continued his studies through, through uh, his uh, early 20s. And yeah, became studied, really studied his the, whole life, right? Studied his whole life, right? I mean, he was an extraordinarily uh, profound reader. You know. Absolutely, yeah. He he built one of the largest, actually, the largest library in the U.S. Penned more than eight thousand letters, and uh, although he only wrote, you know, he he only wrote a few documents that were, were for public consumption. Those have been some of the most important in history. <laughs> yes. Yes, and you know, and, and we should say uh, his dates. Thomas Jefferson was uh, 1743 to 1826. Uh, he, so he he grows up during the during the Enlightenment period. You know, in the in the 18th century, he himself one of the leading lights of the American Enlightenment, and uh, you know, along with people like his Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, you know, so you know some of the great minds of the American Enlightenment. And uh, yeah, Jefferson was extraordinary, extraordinarily well read. And he had, he had like three different libraries, if I recall, one burned down, one he sold to kickstart the Library of Congress, and then he just started another <laughs> one, you know, can't live without books. I think he wrote in a letter to John Adams, which, you know, I can I could certainly, certainly empathize with. So what do we know? Um, I know something about his education. What do we know about his family, John? 
Well, it doesn't he... appear that he had a great relationship with his mother. He really never mentioned her in any of the surviving correspondence. But there's also no evidence that it was that it was strained or anything like that. It's just sort of somewhat cold in that respect. Uh, his father died when he was 14, and he said that at this point he was thrown into the world to fend for himself, essentially. It is a little bit of an exaggeration. Uh, his father had organized his estate well, and there were plans in place, and uh, Jefferson at a later time would inherit a lot of land, money, and, of course, slaves uh, common at this time. Um, so, yeah, I yeah, mean, we'll his... Have... his Go ahead. We'll have a lot. To, we'll have a lot to say about slavery, because uh, you know I, I, I've said this twenty times. This is episode thirty six already, by the way, of the Hero Show. You know, so we, this this has been a lot of fun. They say time flies when you're having fun, and it has. And we've said you know dozens of times on the show. We're not reticent about criticizing Hero for his flaws, including moral flaws. And Jefferson certainly has moral flaws, of which being a you know a, a long time slave owner. Uh, while at the same time a theoretical abolitionist shows a certain element of hypocrisy, but you know we'll we'll criticize Jefferson for his his flaws, including his moral flaws. But you know the man's a giant, and it's not just because he was like six three or you know or, or so he's a, he's, a, he's a giant in terms of his his accomplishments, and so. You know, we will certainly uh, cer certainly focus on that, and we've we've discussed several times, John. You know, the advantage of 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 having tutors or mentors, or you know, you know the studio system, you know, in 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 education. And thank God there were no government schools back then in the 18th century. And and young young Thomas, you know, it was educated with tutors when he, when he was young. Uh, there was there was a local school run by a Presbyterian minister that he attended when he was also you know in, in his early in his early years and, and that you know this, we we know we know a good deal about Jefferson's early early education don't we? Yeah, we we do because he set down some of the details in his autobiography, unfinished autobiography. Uh, unfortunately, Shadwell, the family residence, actually burned in 1770 and destroyed a lot. Like you said, it destroyed his first library, it destroyed a lot of his correspondence. But yeah, we know that he attended an English school starting when he was five. And then he went and studied uh, at the age of nine. He went and studied for five years under uh, Maury. Um, uh, I forget his first name. Yeah, and, the, Reverend, uh, the, Reverend, the Reverend James, James Maury. I'm sorry, Maury, Maury comes into the picture when he's 14 and he studies with Maury for two years and learns Greek and Latin and is able to then read the Greek and Latin authors uh, in the original and, you know, retain that skill throughout his life. Um, and then a couple of years later, uh, he um, he goes at, when he's 20, he enrolls at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. And he meets Dr. William Small, a, a Scottish, uh, a, a Scotchman, a Scottish professor, professor of mathematics that also taught natural sciences. And he says that this is one of the uh, one of the events that really changed the direction of the course of his life, because from William Small, he learned the ideas of the Enlightenment and he was introduced to many of the key players there in Virginia politics, uh, William Small. Was friends with Governor uh, Governor Francis Falquier, whose uh, father had worked for Isaac Newton. Uh, he was also friends with George Wythe, the first law professor in the United States. And Jefferson got to go hang out with these guys at regular dinner parties there in, in Williamsburg, the capital of the biggest, most prosperous colony in America. So here he is at a very young age, getting enlightenment ideas and getting introduced to politics from the key players. At, at a very young and formative age. I think this is this really sets him up and sets up the course of his life. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. And I just want to say, uh, uh, make a few comments comments here, you know, because it's uh, that to have tutors or mentors and you know and such often costs money. And so coming from a affluent family is is certainly an, an advantage in that. Although I think in a free society we could set up private charities, you know, for, for kids you know, who, who are serious students who want an education and, and can't afford private tutors or, or mentors. But the point I want to make here about, about education, and, and Jefferson had an outstanding education, is 
uh, prior to the establishment of government schools in, in this country, we got to get Brad Thompson to come on the show to discuss a- the abolition of, of the government school system. But prior to that, in the mid 19th century, there were a lot more re- you know, small religious schools to, to meet the demand f- for education. And it's not an accident. Uh, Jefferson, when he was very young, studied uh, at a school run by a Presbyterian minister. And then later, like you said, he boarded with the Reverend James Morey for several years and studied history, science and and, and the classics. The You got to give, you, you know, re, religion has been a, an enormously irrational and, and destructive force in human life. But sometimes you got to give the devil his due, or, or in this case, the angels, give the angels th- their due. The... A lot of religious, you know, a lot of clergymen have been sincerely concerned about educating people. Quakers, you know, as a, as a good example, a sincere dedication to education, in, including the poor, and often run their schools very inexpensively. And certainly, the education offer was much better than in the in the in the government schools. And so Jefferson. Got a very fine education. Now, William and Mary, by, by the way, John, I was reading that yesterday uh, about it at, at William and Mary. Reminds reminded me, we've said a number of times on the show, how people who go on to be superstars, geniuses, or, or often uh, uh, are uh, wastrels or they're, you know, they're, they're partiers when they're young. And I was reading that with Jefferson's first year at William and Mary, he spent more time partying and more time at parties and, and Dan and dances and, and squandering his inheritance. Uh, and after that, he realized, oh, wait a minute, where, 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 where am I going with my life? And his second year at William and Mary, he said he, he dedicated to studying 15 hours a day. So I mean, he turned that ship around, you know, in a, in a hurry. He was he was a, a uh, he was just a, a, a prodigious reader and just truly truly you know, we're really lucky for whatever his flaws John we're really lucky that in the 18th century the 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 small American colonies you know with a with a re- you know, relatively minuscule population what a collection of of geniuses you know Jefferson at the top here but Franklin who we who we've honored uh, Madison who we've honored John Adams who we will because didn't Brad Thompson say he was going to come on the show he promised he was going to convince us that John Adams was the most important of the American founders didn't he say did he promise to do that yep all we've right got so an IOU we, uh, after him. yeah absolutely 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 but jefferson's a pro- prodigious intellect and uh, oh one last thing i wanted to say before you go on william small you we later on returned to uh, britain where he became one of the shining members of the the lunar society of birmingham that without We've also honored on the on the Hero Show the episode we did on Joseph Priestley and the and the Lunar Society. William Small became you know one of the leading lights of the Lunar Society. Another brilliant mind and and Jefferson. You're right, John. Jefferson said William Small. I don't remember the exact quote, but William Small set the direction of my life. He you know he's, he he showed me. Uh, he was the one who introduced. He was the one, wasn't it, who introduced Jefferson to the Enlightenment thinkers and people like and people like uh, John Locke and, and Montesquieu and you know and people you know and people like that. That Jefferson went on to read carefully. Well, I, the the record indicates that Jefferson first bought John Locke and Montesquieu and Jean Jacques Burlamaqui uh, when he was uh, when the, the first year that he was elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses. So that would have been a little later when he was 26. But uh, okay. he did learn right. a lot about the natural sciences and a lot about the you know uh, natural theory of law f- directly from Small. Um, also, like we said, Small introduced him to George Wythe, the, the, first, uh, law, the, the first law professor, if you will, in the U.S. The, the teaching of law then was a lot less formal than it is today. And essentially you would go and you would uh, typically find a, a, some sort of mentor who could tell you what to read and in what order, but also would have you do all sorts of, of odd jobs for them, do, do some of their basic legal work and essentially uh, sort of like clerking for them. And Jefferson was really thankful that George Wythe didn't have him do that that other stuff. He basically just told him what to to read and in what order. He later said that uh, all this all all these different odd jobs that young lawyers have to do really 
keep them from the deep study that they need. And like you said, he would study for 15, 16 hours a day. Uh, he later said that a mind always employed is always happy. And he said that it's wonderful how much may be done if we we're always doing. So uh, when he wasn't studying law, he, he was deeply interested in all aspects of enlightenment culture and uh, in life and art and architecture said that music was his chief passion in life. He was a self-taught violinist and he also taught himself architecture in these early formative years. So after a few years studying with George with, uh, he is elected to the Virginia house of Burgesses and, and, and in 1768, a couple of years before that he begins planning and, uh, laying the groundwork for Monticello. Jefferson, by the way, is America's first, he gets the title of America's first architect. In addition to all of his other great achievements, he was the first to really sit down and draw plans of a building before building it and to introduce to that many different architectural styles. Um, and if you've never been to Monticello, uh, I, I have, and it was just a, a mind blowing experience to see really the embodiment of Jefferson's genius in a building. Uh, the, the dome, the, there are dumb waiters in the sides of the, uh, fireplace such that he basically a little, a, a little elevator for wine bottles. So you could send an empty bottle down to the basement and a fresh one would appear, uh, double doors where you could just press one and both would open. It's got this very interesting alcove bed and he designed all sorts of gadgets, uh, uh, uh probably the most interesting of which is the, uh, the calendar clock that not only tells the time, but the day of the week. So uh, all a monument to, to Jefferson's resplendent and very uh, varied genius. And uh, I highly recommend to anyone who can to go check it out. Oh, I, I agree. Absolutely. And, and I just want to comment on, you know, you made, you made some important points over and over and over again, we've seen uh, you know, when we when we've been uh, honoring these great heroes, the, the work ethic, the commitment to hard work, you know, whether it was Frederick Douglass or Benjamin Franklin or Michelangelo or Thomas Jefferson, you know, and all these varied fields, sciences, science, sculpting, writing, you know, whatever, whatever, freedom fighting, the, the, com the, the, the awareness that you know, Frederick Douglass wrote about it. Benjamin Franklin wrote about it. Those were our first two shows, right? Frederick Douglass and Franklin. Yeah. You know, really, really, you know, monumental hard workers who who pointed out this is the way to rise. You know, if, if you live in a, in a semi-free society, and of course, Frederick Douglass, uh, uh, unfortunately, was born in, into slavery, but from which he escaped heroically. But if you live in a semi-free society, and even today, uh, I think we're we're free enough. This is the way to rise. There's no there's no secret to it. The the, the sweat put in the sweat equity. The great Jerry Rice, you know, great NFL player. But you put in the sweat equity, and and you, Jefferson studying 15 hours a day. I mean, I like to think I'm a hard worker, John, but 15 hours a day. I I you know I I don't know I don't want to work 15 hours a day. I like to sit sit around, relax. You, you know, watch watch a movie and and everything. That's uh, we were talking about Michelangelo, though, you know, and, the, and, and basically his, his life was given to work and he died, what, three weeks short of his 89th birthday in the 16th <laughs> century. Uh, I don't want to work that hard. So maybe that's why I'm not Michelangelo or Thomas Jefferson or, so, or some great genius like that. But that but it is the commitment to, to the commitment to work ethic. There is no matter how much talent you have, there's no escaping the need, you know, for that for that strong work ethic. In my judgment. You know, Ayn Rand is the greatest novelist in world literature, but she said she wrote every page of Atlas Shrugged at least five times. Now that's at least five thousand pages. So this is there's there's no secret to this. And Jefferson is one more example embodying, you know, the strong work ethic as a as a means to rise to great achievements. Yeah, not everybody in in life will want to be a first rate legal scholar, but if you want to be then you have to put in that work. And, and Jefferson did, uh, he, as he was studying law, the, the backdrop to this was that the, the British were increasingly passing, uh, various acts that, uh, infringed the freedoms of the colonists. 
the uh, 1765 Stamp Act, uh, explicit tax, the first explicit tax to uh, raise money for the crown. And as soon as Jefferson gets into the Virginia House of, of Burgesses, uh, within 10 days, or actually exactly 10 days, the governor there was basically just a British proxy, disbanded the, the, uh, the House of Burgesses. And so they had to start meeting at a tavern. Uh, but, you know, this early preparation, to get back to your point, is what enabled him at 26. I mean, how many 26 year olds, how many people in their 20s today are getting elected to these, you know, the, the governing body of the biggest, uh, the, the largest states, most successful, most wealthy states uh, legislature? Not very many. I mean, this takes serious, uh, serious knowledge, serious credibility. And Jefferson has built that very, very early on. So, uh, yeah, I, I 100% agree. It, like Frederick Douglass said, work, 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 work. If you want to, uh, if you want to achieve something really fascinating and, and uh, uh, first rate. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's from Poor Richard's Almanac, wasn't it? Wasn't that our, our, yep. our, our man, well, Benjamin Franklin? Yeah, good old, yo. But one more example from American history, John. I, I remember a long time ago reading a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln was a frontiersman, you know, he was a backwoods, backwoodsman. And the, you know, the legends that he used to have to walk miles to borrow a book from somebody, bring it back to his log cabin and read it by, by candlelight or something. Those, those legends may well be true. Certainly, it was it was an arduous affair for the young Abe, Abe Lincoln, the rail splitter, you know, to get the education he desired. But there's a great quote from him where he said, "You know, I will study and 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 make myself ready, and one day my chance will come." And you know, and you know, the, the there again, there's a, the, another example. We could we could give examples in every in every field of people who reach great success, uh, you know, you know, doing so. You got to be born with a certain level of talent to reach that to reach that level, but the work ethic is indispensable. And Jefferson embodies it with his study, you know, fifteen or sixteen hours a day. So, uh, yeah, he's he's young in politics, and he at, at the Second Continental Congress, he was one of the youngest. He was one of the youngest representatives there, wasn't he? Seventeen seventy-five. Yeah, he's yeah, only, yeah. So he, in, he, in seventy-four, he's only, thir he's only thirty-two. Uh, yep. He, he, and what gets him there is his summary view of the rights of the uh, of the colonies of North America. Um, his summary view, as it's typically called, is an early set of talking points that he he prepared as directions to the delegates to the first Continental Congress in 1774 as a list of pointers of, of talking points of things that they could bring up and debate there at the Continental Congress, but these were seen as too radical at this point. Um, they hinted at a possible break with Britain, and they made a legal claim, a historic and legal claim that many disagreed with, including later John Quincy Adams would write, you know, 50 years later, this, this argument doesn't make sense, but it was not wholly, uh, uh, it was not wholly incredible at the time, at least, that the only tie between the colonies of North America and the British government was the king, and that Parliament had no authority to govern in the colonies. And so um, Jefferson makes this argument at length. He also gives a series of, of grievances that the colonists have with the king, among them, you know, disbanding our governments. Uh, forcing people to go to England to be tried. And many of these would be echoed, reprised in the Declaration of, of Independence. He would, uh, he would add to this list. But this document, although it wasn't used as anything official within the Constitutional Convention, ended up being printed and distributed among the delegates and read. And it was on the basis of his writing of very very obvious talent as a writer early on that he was then elected to uh, to attend the Constitutional Convention of 76. 
sorry, constitutional continental Congress of 76. And, uh, you know, as we'll, as we'll get to, um, you know, probably Jefferson's biggest achievement, the declaration of independence, and he would be given that job as well on the basis of this credential of having been the author of some review. Right. You know, and if we, if we go, let me ask you a procedural question here, John, because if we go chronologically through Jefferson's life, it's going to take us like hours to, you know, to recount all of his accomplishments. Maybe we should just, you know, start talking about the, the, the greatest of his accomplishments to make sure we get, to make sure we get all, all of those in. Uh, and, and so, of course, the first one, of course, would be the DOI, the Declaration of, of Independence. So second contest, see if I remember my American... Oh, here we are. There's that great painting that we both love, uh, John uh, Jean Leon Jerome Ferris writing the Declaration of Independence, 1776. And we see you were po you pointed out before, John, that it's unhistorical in, in that Benjamin Franklin was sick, you know, at at the time. But but Ferris captures the essence of these you know, the Committee of Five, and here's the Committee of Three. Right, the, the the brain trust, the three, yeah. three giant, yeah, the brain trust. There you go, nicely. Franklin depicted reading the the deck, the or a draft of the Declaration. John Adams sitting there, you know, thinking philosophically, and and Jefferson, of course, the primary author, standing. I love the I love the discarded you know drafts on the floor. It it it, it, it indicates. You know, it's just like Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand says, you know, in The Fountainhead with Howard Rourke, he said, I, Howard Rourke says, you know, I design as much more garbage than any other architect does. My only claim is my garbage, you know, my junk ends in the waste paper basket. And he's speaking for the author there who's writing, you know, with Atlas Shrugged, like we said, five pages, uh, every page at least five times. If you're going to write something that's really, really, really good. This is what it looks like. You, you discard the early drafts and you just keep, you keep at it. But um, so, so Second Continental Congress, as you might remember my American history, that was uh, 1775, right? The shot heard around the world is April 1775. Jefferson's very young. He's 32 in 1775. He's, you can see, and, and the painting is accurate here, he's a lot younger than Adams and Franklin, that's for sure. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, John, because I think you know the details of American history more, but I think the committee wanted Franklin to to write the the declaration, correct? Because Franklin was a great writer himself. He he spent you know one of his many accomplishments, as we discussed. Franklin spent a lot of time working on his writing, and he was a very accomplished pro pro stylist. And and his autobiography is a you know is a is a cl absolute classic. But Franklin Franklin de deferred to the young Thomas Jefferson in part because he thought Jefferson was even a superior writer, but I think in part because he wanted to avoid this, you know, all the, all I'm pointing to all the discards on the floor, all the criticisms and the editing you're going to get, you know, from, 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 from people. And so let, let, let Tom do it. You know, I think, I think that yeah. was, was also part of Franklin's reason, which if so, is, it shows how, just again, shows how wise that Franklin was. Yeah, Franklin is that, is that said, accurate? I yeah. will not write a, a document that will be edited by a public body. And then John <laughs> Adams, who would have been sort of next in line, certainly the greatest constitutional mind of, of the group here. Uh, he says, well, I think you should write it. Reason first, uh, you are a Virginian and a Virginian should be at the head of this thing. Reason second, I am disliked and you are very much liked. And reason three, you're 10 times better at writing than I am. <laughs> so <laughs> John Adams certainly saw Jefferson's merits here. And it's funny, I don't have the exact anecdote later, right at hand, but uh, Franklin consoled uh, Jefferson later when his declaration was being edited by the entire Congress, not just by this committee of five with a brilliant story that I re relay, um, just copying from, from Franklin himself in uh, my piece, Benjamin Franklin, The Enlightenment Personifies. So if you want a good laugh as to Franklin's thoughts on writing for a, a public body, check that out. Can, can, you, re can you relate it briefly? What did, what did there was what a, was a, Franklin? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a shot. So. Uh, there was a, a gentleman who is a merchant who was selling hats 
and uh, he he painted a sign or he was going to have a sign painted that that uh, marketed his business and it said uh, something like John Smith uh, sells hats for ready money and so he asked his friends what they thought and the first one said well um, you know it, it's not really uh, important that you say ready money here so you should probably cut that another person another friend he asked said uh, well, I mean, there's a, a, a hat painted on the sign. Do you really need that? Can you just have the uh, picture of the hat? And a third friend said, well, is it really important who you are? Does that need to be on the sign either? And so he ended up with just a uh, painting of a hat on his side. <laughs> There you go. That sounds like that sounds like Franklin's humor. And uh, that essay was published in the Objective Standard, right? Yep, you got it. Great, great. Okay, so here's Jefferson. You know, age thirty-two years old, Second Continental Congress. Uh, of course, the following year, seventeen seventy-six. Of course, monumental year in um, American history. Jefferson's thirty-three. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, he's forty-three. He's in his. He's, he was born in. in no, yeah, 1743. So yeah, he's in his 30s. I mean, he's in he's in his 30s in 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 the, in the 17 in the 1770s. Young, he's a young guy with with that responsibility. But one of Jefferson's many claims to fame is he was one of the. Early, I think you alluded to this before, John. He was one of the early proponents of American uh, liberty of 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 splitting from from Great Britain and, and American independence and establishing a, 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 an autonomous and distinct nation. So he was visionary in in that regard. So we're going to discuss his flaws, but you know, you know for sure. But the Declaration of Independence alone established as, he, as the primary author. But that alone establishes him as uh, you know as a giant in in American history. Not to mention you know all all of his all of his other uh, accomplishments. I mean, where do we even where do we even begin? So if so, so we're not here for 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 days, right? I mean, he was the representative to France, U.S. representative to France, I think was appointed there in, was it 1785? There's a great story, John, you know, about these these two giants, Jefferson and Franklin. I don't know whether it's true or, or not, but when, when Jefferson arrives at, at court in France, after Franklin had been the American ambassador, and, and in that stilted language at court, they ask him, sir, so are, are you... The re, are you the replacement for Dr. Franklin? And Jefferson is said to have responded, sir, one does not replace Dr. Franklin. I am merely his successor. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I don't know if that story is true or if it's apocryphal. But I like, believe it, it is. Like, I, I've read that in several places. So, yeah, I, I yeah. think that's a, definitely what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even you know they, they say if, if this story ain't true, it ought to be. So, you, you know, it's a great... A, a tribute from you know it's a truly a, a sincere and, and and heartfelt tribute from one from one great man to another. Uh, he was, Jefferson was the was the first Secretary of State in U.S. history, right? In in George Washington's first administration, serving as the Secretary of State from 1790 to 1793. Uh, during yeah. those during the, yeah conducted notable battles with Alexander Hamilton, another founder who we've honored about you know, the, the proper future of, of the United States. Well, is this, I just want to make one more point before, before you go on, John. I think, you know, Hamilton's vision of an industrial capitalist urban America was, was, the, was the right direction to go. In contrast to Jefferson's agrarian, you know, vision. But the thing about Jefferson that always stands out for me in a in a very positive way is what an individualist Jefferson was. You know, he's a staunch defender of the individual and his vision. Yeah, agrarian, and you know, and he was, yeah, he was very skeptical and leery about urban centers and in, industrialization. You know, and, and you know, I think he was mistaken there. But every man a landowner. You know, you work for yourself. You know, you, you 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 live your own life. Your life is yours, 
all politics is local, right? Politics should be done locally, in small enclaves in in the community. You get, they get together every you know, once a month or whatever, and you know, and pass and you know, pass laws. But but the individualism of Jefferson is what you know. I just I got I got I got to salute that. I mean, he he really had a he really had a feel and a strong commitment to the rights of an individual to live to live his own life. That's that's one the thing that's so noteworthy. One one thing that's so note, noteworthy, I think, about Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, and you see this in one of his greatest achievements, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. He said right. of this, the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others, but it does me no injury for my neighbor to say that there are 20 gods or no god, neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. And I think that, you know, obviously yeah, this, this Virginia guy. Statute, by the way, this became the basis of the, uh, of one of the bill, uh, of the bill of Rights, excuse me. Uh, this became the basis for Madison to then take and, and uh, integrate into the Bill of Rights and become national law. Uh, so at the time, it was common for uh, state constitutions, state laws to mention religious toleration. Yeah, we'll tolerate your religion, whatever religion it happens to be. Um, we will tolerate to some extent. There are some that we won't tolerate. But the idea of toleration really, uh, really disturbed Jefferson. He didn't want there to just be the state will tolerate your religion. The state will also uh, help fund certain religions, uh, have a, a tax for this or that religion that uh, funds that this or that church. So you have these competing sects that are some are government funded and some aren't. Jefferson saw this as anathema to freedom. And so his Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, one of three accomplishments, only three that ended mm -hmm. up, he, he wrote the uh, he wrote the text for his tombstone. This is one of the only ones that he chose. The others being uh, authoring the Declaration of Independence, of course, and lastly founding the University of Virginia, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about. But so he saw this as one of his his greatest accomplishments, as far as his views. Yeah of an agrarian America. Well, I think that, yeah, this is true in his uh, notes on the state of Virginia, uh, which he wrote at the request of, uh, I believe a, a French marquis or something who wanted to, to learn more about the US. Um, he expressed some views that definitely seem a bit backward when compared to Hamilton's. I don't know if these were his uh, final views on the subject, but they certainly are commonly interpreted to be that. But at a more fundamental level, Jefferson was all about individual rights, like you mm -hmm. said. And so uh, the individual being the, the unit of moral concern, having autonomy, being able to, to live his life as, as he sees fit, that leaves him open to pursue other fields. And that leaves, leaves him free to start a business, start an industrial concern, build ships, sort of factory, any of this stuff. And Jefferson at that, at that level of political moral principle would never have opposed any of that. Um, you know, he said in right. his sure. uh, 1801 uh, inauguration speech that a frugal, a wise and frugal government which will, shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement and shall not take from the mouth of labor, the bread it has earned, this is the sum of good government. And so this idea of government, which unfortunately seems to be long gone in America today, leaves open all industry and improvement, including the, the various uh, types of businesses that Hamilton to some extent wanted to subsidize. And I think this is what really bothered Jefferson, not only that, but Hamilton's means of, of uh, bringing about this new economic powerhouse of America in, required going beyond what was actually written in the Constitution. And so that, I think, was the heart of the conflict between the two. Right. And you're absolutely right. We need, here's why we celebrate Thomas Jefferson and glorify him a staunch support of individual rights in the 18th century, standing up 
you know, for, for the individual, as you said, the, the unit of moral value. Jefferson is an ardent individualist, and that's that's the, his greatest. I think that's his greatest quality. And I love I love the quote. You know, I swear swear eternal hostility to every form of tyranny over the mind of man, which shows his recognition. Also, not surprising given what an intellectual he was. You know, and, and how philosophical he was. He recognizes that the essence of being an individual is independent thinking is and and having and having the liberty to act on your own independent judgment and any form of of tyranny over the mind of man he said he didn't say well you know over man or over the body of man he said over the mind of man he recognizes you know that that this is the essence of individualism is 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 independent thinking and 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 you're right. The the Virginia statute of religious freedom. It's not about toleration. That that assumes that the state or the church or whatever has the power to to gener- to, to decide. Well, we're gonna what we're gonna tolerate and what we're not gonna tolerate. It reminds me, you know, a discussion I had. This comes up in class a lot, John, and you know, and everybody, you know, I'll, you know, I'll be discussing individual rights, and somebody's it's been, it's been several times. Somebody come comes out and says, so you think that if we just let people do whatever they want, there's going to be, you know, we're going to have a, a you know, a, a good society. And I respond, no, I don't think we should let people do anything. And they, and they go with the stupid, why? Well, what you just said, you know, you, you got to be free to do this, that, the other thing, you know, and I respond, well, I believe that we must respect the inalienable right of, of, of every individual to do as he or she will, so long as they don't initiate force or fraud, you know, against innocent victims. And I think, you know, this pre, pre Iron Man, but Jefferson recognized there's a big difference between freedom or liberty on the one hand and tolerance on the other. And there's, you know, the inalienable right of an individual to hold any religious views he wants, as long as he doesn't try and burn me at the stake, you know, and you know, initiate force against innocent, uh, innocent victims who did, who disagree with him. And again, you're absolutely right. The, I mean, his buddy James Madison wrote this into the into the First Amendment, the first clause of the First Amendment. You know, the Madison and Jefferson were both such staunch supporters of religious freedom, and that was a big deal back then. And even even today, you know, I don't know if our buddies at ISIS are still around. I haven't heard you know about them much, but you know, even today, with you know, these fanatics, these Islamic fanatics, are going to kill you. Starting with their co-religionists, they, they kill, I don't know how many you know, fellow Muslims who disagree with their specific interpretation of the Quran, and then branching out to everybody else, Christians, Jews, Hindus, you know, uh, agnostics, atheists. If you don't accept our version of God, we're going to kill you. Even today, in the 21st century, this is, you know, this is revolutionary. So, yeah, you're, you're, it's, it's, it, it is fascinating. You're absolutely right. The three things Jefferson, up from this plethora of achievements in the man's life, the three things, you know, he put on, he wanted to put on his tombstone. Did he think his tombstone was small? You know, he could, he could have put a lot more on there, but those are the, those are the three. And, and religious, religious freedom is a huge step forward, you know, in the battle for, for liberty. And you give the American founders their, their propers, you know, for, for this, because God knows how many people have been killed you know, over the over the centuries, the millennia, including you know, to, uh, to this day, over religious differences. So the idea of religious freedom is a revolution, and Jefferson and Madison get get major propers for that. And just one last point on this: Madison, as I recall, well, you know, he he wasn't sure that a, a bill of rights was even necessary. Right? He thought the he thought that the state constitutions guaranteed these you know liberties. The con- the U.S. Constitution made it clear. And he corresponded with his buddy Thomas Jefferson in in in, in France. Joseph Ellis, you know, tells this story nicely. Jefferson kept writing, kept writing back to him. We need a bill of rights. We need a bill of rights. We need a bill of rights. And did I mention we need a bill of rights? He said, that individualism of Jefferson. You just gotta, you just gotta love it. You know, of all his flaws, as we'll discuss, you, the individualism sets him, makes him a giant. Yeah, and I believe his his idea of individual rights certainly extended to all people. He saw this as a universal principle. He didn't think, as some people seem to think today, that he was discussing the rights of white people. This is certainly not Jefferson's view of rights. Uh, and, and take it from Lincoln, who said that all honor to Jefferson, to the man who in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people had the coolness forecast and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth 
applicable to all men in all times. And so to embalm it there that today and in all coming days, it shall re be a rebuke and a stumbling block, to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. Lincoln saw that Jefferson had set down the principle, the principle that eventually would topple slavery in this country, but not without, as, as Jefferson thought would happen, a war and bloodshed. But even in 1770, he, he began his uh, career as a lawyer uh, doing pro bono work. He, he uh, represented a mulatto man free of charge, and he said that under the law of nature, all men are born free. Everyone comes into the world with a right to his own person, which includes the liberty of moving and using his body as his own will. He uh, seconded a bill to legalize manumission. It wasn't even legal at this time in Virginia to free your slaves. This was shot down not only by the Virginians, but when they finally got the support of the, Gin the Virginians, it was shot down by the King's Council, the governor of Virginia, British proxy, and by the King himself. And so in both the summary view and the Declaration of Independence, he denounces the slave trade and he denounces King George III for outlawing and vetoing these acts to, uh, to, uh, to mitigate slavery. In uh, 70, 78, 1778, he, uh, he has a bill to outlaw the importation of slaves in Virginia. And this gets passed remarkably. It becomes the first state in the world to do so. Um, he, he sought an amendment there as well saying that after a certain age or all born after a certain day would be set free. Uh, but this, unfortunately, the, Virginia was not yet ripe for that. And, and unfortunately, would really go in an opposite direction for many decades afterward. But Jefferson's record on slavery is, uh, it's, it's studded with real accomplishments, real steps in the right direction. Uh, so yes. 1784 proposed a law to ban slavery in all new states, and it failed by one vote, but it became right. the, the basis for the Northwest, Northwest Ordinance passed in 1787, and so achieved that same aim, but in all states west of the, the uh, Mississippi and, and north of the Ohio River. Um, and then, you know, we've got to mention 1807 signs the bill right. banning the international slave, slave trade. Uh, asked right. Congress for this bill, and and they uh, they brought it to him, and, and he signed it into law. Uh, so, yeah, that was the earliest that the U.S. Congress was was it a constitutional was agreement at the Constitutional Convention that the earliest that Congress could ban the slave trade was 18, 1807, 1808, I, I believe, and Thomas Jefferson certainly supported it and signed that signed that bill into law, as you, as you as you said, John. You know, it's so difficult to objectively judge Thomas Jefferson today, you know, on, on, on the issue of slavery, because he's a staunch individualist. Um, you know, he, he was a, a th theoretically an abolitionist his entire life. Like you said, his, his actual political practice is nice words studded with, with, with real achievements, you know, regarding slavery. And yet Jefferson himself, you know, owned slaves his his entire adult life. I, if I remember correctly, didn't even free them at his at his death. Then there's you know the the probable romantic relationship with Sally Hemings, uh, that you know who with whom he very. I, I know the historians disagree on this, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm just guessing here that, that 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 relationship you know was was a real romantic relationship. They had children together. I don't think he ever, I don't think he ever even freed her. Did he? I don't. I don't. I don't think he did. But um, yeah, I don't know. This is is contested by scholars whether or not they had a relationship. Yeah. And as far as I know, he didn't free her. I do know that he died more than a hundred thousand dollars in in eighteen twenty six dollars in debt. That's a and lot of money. Legally, did not have the ability because his property was owned by his debtors, and so uh, you know by the laws of the day. I think he would have had a, a very hard time um, freeing them. I mean, the obvious objection to this, though, is that Jefferson lived a very, he lived high on the hog. I mean, he, he uh, in the White House, was constantly entertaining. 
uh, loved wine and was always uh, acquiring more and more wine. And like we said, he had the largest collection of books in the country. And once he gave up his book collection to uh, found the Library of Congress, he began another one. So he he definitely uh, he lived the high life. He he wasn't really making a, a great effort. And I think it's in large part, and you know, we can uh, we can promote C. Bradley Thompson's book here, the America's Revolutionary Mind. Madison, Jefferson, and many of the other founders saw the uh, emancipation of slaves as a tremendous paradox. If we free them, what will happen? If we free them, will will there be race war? Um, if we uh, free them, are are we going to have to uh, also then provide some form of education for them? What do we do? They they couldn't figure this problem out. They thought that there would be bloodshed, and unfortunately, they kicked the can down the road. And just culturally, the U.S. got a lot worse in the decades after the the founding generation, and uh, you know imported the ideas of, of Hegel and others who, who thought that there were no, they, they, they reputed these enlightenment ideas of universal truth. They thought, well, yeah, well, there are, are different truths for different times, different places. And here in the South, this is our truth. And we are proponents of states' rights. And we think that people should be able to do this. So uh, it's really right. unfortunate that the founding generation didn't take that step but they didn't, and they thought it was the only way to get the country started. And we don't know if right. they were Jefferson, right or not. But well, Jefferson, I think you mentioned it, John. It bears repetition. Jefferson certainly thought that emancipation of slavery was was the morally right thing to do, uh, and he was, as you know, you, you quote from Lincoln, Jefferson was deeply troubled that the slavery issue was going to tear the country apart, was going to lead, you know, he was, he was prescient on, on this, was going to tear the country apart, lead to enormous bloodshed. And, and he was right. And he was, he was right on that. I know, I know some of the, uh, in the, in the revolutionary generation, certainly in the early 19th century, the thinking was, can we establish colonies, you know, in, in Africa and, uh, you know, the former, you know, the, uh, African American slaves can be repatriated to Africa, but that that was fraught with all kinds of problems too. Not to mention that you know there there were hostile tribes in Africa who didn't want you know these uh, these uh, uh, former slaves to to settle in in Liberia or, or Sierra Sierra Leone, I think was the British colony, and many many of the slaves themselves, if freed, would, may not want to go back to Africa. They may, may want to stay. They want to stay, exercise their rights as individual human beings to to live in America rather than in in Africa. So it's fraught with difficulties. It's just you know you can't. We we. It's just it's, it's just this this paradox. And you know I'm gonna you know say a hypocritical uh, element of uh, a huge element of hypocrisy in, in Jefferson that he's this staunch individualist. He's a theoretical abol abolitionist. Politically, as you pointed out, he, was, he supported various you know, measures against slavery and yet owned, owned slaves his entire life. Now, you know, you can go back and forth on this issue because Jefferson's born in 1743. He's born into a world where slavery is just accepted. It's all over the world. As you know, Thomas Sowell points out, one of, one of the other heroes we've you know, dedicated the show to, Thomas Sowell and other people point out, slavery's existed all over the world, everywhere, going back into prehistory. And it's only in the 18th century that you get a concerted abolitionist movement based on the individual rights principles of, of people of people like Locke, John Locke, and 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 Thomas Jefferson. So on you know, one hand, I say, well, you know, he he's just born into a world where slavery was just accepted. Am I going to criticize him for not for not being revolutionary enough? You know, his his ideas of what leads to the uh, leads to the Thirteenth Amendment in in 1865, which is true. All of that's true. Yet at the same time. So he's, you know, Washington at least freed his slaves, you know, at, at, at his death and, and made provisions for some of them to have some money so that it, to ease the trans, the difficult, the arduous transition into, into freedom. Uh, Jefferson was a lifelong slave owner. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a major, I think it's a major element of hypocrisy. Uh, it's certainly a, a, certainly a moral stain on his character, a moral stain on, the moral stain on the history of, of, of the United States. And yet, at the same time, I have no doubt 
Jefferson's a hero because of all of his enormous achievements, including being the staunch individualist that leads to the abolition of this horrific uh, institution in the United States and in, in, in many places uh, around the world. So it's, it's really hard to be objective with, with Jefferson on this issue. Yeah, his record is certainly not unblemished. He, he was very mixed, but in the end, his virtues far, far outweighed his vices. And without yes. his contributions to American history, who knows how quickly some of these uh, actions would have been taken on slavery and, and what the record would have been. Jefferson made huge strides in the right direction. At, at a personal level, we can certainly condemn that he, he never freed his slaves, that he partook in this hideous institution. But he, he spoke the words that really set off the alarm bells in people's minds. And uh, he set down this principle that ultimately led to the abolition of slavery. And so we definitely yes. have to thank him for that. And, uh, right. and this, the world would be a lot less good than it is today if it were not for Jefferson. That, that's a good point, John, because slavery would have continued did, with or without Jefferson. It's been around for thousands of years. It's still, it's still with us. The you know, communists use slave labor in, 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 in North Korea, China. They have gulags you know, for political prisoners. There's God knows how many thousands of black slaves in, in Sudan. You know, under Islam, uh, you can't enslave a co-religionist, but anybody else is fair game. And, and so, you know, Black Christians uh, in, in Sudan, uh, thousands of slaves, even as even as we speak. So slavery continued with or without Thomas Jefferson. But would it have been abolished without him uh, in the United States? Maybe, maybe there were other uh, founders who were individualists. But certainly Jefferson is one of the leading lights of, of individualism that leads to to abolitionism in this country. So I mean, that's an that's a, an important point. And I know I want to make. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a philosopher. I got to make some a couple of philosophic points here. One against anti the anti hero mentality, and second one I want to rail against cancel culture and the the overt racism that's spewed out by the political left in this country to the point where I just you know I just want to like strangle one of them. I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to I'm not going but I'm going to intellectually and morally denounce it. First of all, the anti hero mentality you know, that's so. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's so prevalent in modernist in modernist culture, and, it's, and you know, it's it's the idea that well, you know, we're human beings; we all have flaws. There, are, there aren't any heroes. The flaws, the flaws uh, pre predominate. Or you know, you know, or the at the very least, we have to give a balanced account. You, you know that the heroes did did these things, but they all have all these blemishes, and, you, and that's you know that's true insofar as it goes. But you put it nicely, that Jefferson. And, and, and with many heroes, some of the American slave owners like Washington and 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 Madison, um, the, the 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 virtues and the achievements vastly outweigh the the flaws vastly by many orders of magnitude. I, I mean, Thomas Edison may perhaps have neglected his children, and if he do, if he did, that's a bad thing. If you bring children into the world, you're responsible to take care of them. You have to do all kinds of things you know, for them. They 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 need it, and they you know, it's a, it's right and proper that a parent spend times, you know, all this quality time with with the children. So if Edison neglected his children, that's certainly a moral blemish. We'll discuss Edison on the Hero Show, and we'll we'll do the research. And if he did, we'll we'll morally criticize him for it. But his achievements, you know, vastly outweigh that, which is why he'd be on the Hero Show, not the Villain Show, right? Where we had Karl Marx. He, his his achievements vastly outweigh that. Furthermore, as Ayn Rand pointed out brilliantly. The, it's it's more important to reward the good than it is to to punish the wicked. It's it's it is it is important to to punish the bad guys, but the good are the ones who make life, human life possible, and the good are the ones we should be focused on. Reward the good more important than punishing the evil. That's a that's a brilliant moral insight on on Ayn Rand Ayn Rand's Ayn Rand's part. And Thomas Edison with the electric light system and his other inventions certainly made, you know, made human life much better because of him. Jefferson with the Declaration of Independence, religious freedom, support, support for individualism and individual rights uh, and, and abolition certainly made human life vastly better because of his, his accomplishments. And so uh, the hero, this is the hero show. We're not going to do an anti-hero show, you know, for, for, 
for those reasons. And then secondly, I'm doing this, I'll keep this brief, John, I promise. That cancel culture mentality today, you know, uh, and that and that white people are all inveterately racist and uh, we're all, that's just irrational and it's just flat out false. And Jefferson, Jefferson's an example. You could be used of you know, of somebody you know, who was a slave owner, and, and I know at least for a while in his life he thought he thought that that blacks might be intellectually inferior to white people. Or I think he changed his mind, uh, you know, uh, as he as he met various blacks who were exceptionally intelligent. I think he came to to change his mind uh, on that issue. So we yeah you know, we criticize him for that, but I'm not tearing down any statues of Thomas Jefferson. I'm gonna put statues up, you know, paintings like this, paintings of, you know, of the brilliant paintings of the, the writing of the, of the Declaration of, of Independence. It's historically inaccurate to claim, you know, to argue that Western civilization or white people are inher- inherently evil or destructive or exploitative. It overlooks an enormous amount of achievements, John. You know, that would that would overlook Aristotle and Newton and you know and, and Shakespeare and Mozart and you know and and John Locke and Jefferson's achievements that we've been discussing. Those kind of claims coming from the left today are just they're they're irrational and they're evil and they're simply to be repudiated. Jefferson's a giant, flawed giant. He's a towering hero, a morally flawed hero, but he's a towering hero nevertheless, and it's absolutely right and proper that we dis- we, we celebrate him. And it's some kind of crime in this country that we don't have a national holiday to celebrate Thomas Jefferson's birthday. So I got a lot more I could say on that, but you know, I, I'll, 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 draw, I'll draw a line here. Yeah, I think it was Merrill Peterson, one of Jefferson's biographers, who said that if we want to understand America's very you know, uh, uh, mixed past, then we have to understand Jefferson because Jefferson is the key figure. He represents both sides. If we throw out Jefferson, if we give in his cancel culture, if we, if we get rid of Jefferson's statues and attempt to erase him and his importance from history, then we really throw out the key idea of America because he enunciated the principle of individual rights of individualism, the philosophy more eloquently than anyone has in history. And so he definitely deserves tremendous respect, uh, cancel culture, uh, you know, various attempts to, to get rid of his statues. This to me is just bizarre. It's just a total historical ignorance. We need to cancel, cancel culture. And, and, and I think some of the people we should cancel, we could start with Karl Marx, who we, you know, we studied on, <laughs> uh, on, the, on the villain show and some of his progeny. Well, you know, whether it was Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, all the Marxists in the American universities today. You know, and I'm not, I don't mean literally. I don't, I don't, I don't, I ain't going to fire people from their jobs because they spew out Marxist pig slop, you know, in, in, in place of philosophy. But we, they need to be condemned, certainly. And in, in universities encouraged the highest scholars who are much more rational and recognize the virtues of individual rights, capitalism. And Thomas Jefferson, yeah, and, yeah, and I want to make this this point here related to that. Yeah, Jefferson's mixed in this regard on slavery. So on the one hand, he simply he's adopted the irrationality of the past that that you know you conquer somebody in battle and then you 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 kill off your primary enemies and you you the main the main dangers you enslave everybody else. That's a legacy of the primordial pre individualist past. But what's th- th- that he shared with eight zillion other human beings in history, and unfortunately continuing to this day, since slavery c- continues to this day. But what's distinctive here is the way he embodies the Enlightenment principles, the en- Enlightenment principles of, of reason and, ind- and individual rights. That's what's distinctive. That's what's new. And like you just said, he embodied it as brilliantly, maybe more brilliantly than anybody. And that's why we celebrate Thomas Jefferson. I just want to say one last point here because I know we're running out of time. We could, talk, we could discuss Jefferson for days. We did two shows on Washington. And, you know, uh, we could certainly do more than more than one show on Jefferson. But as as president, John, the establishment of the United States Navy, I think, you know, is uh, is 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 telling in 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 a number of ways because the Barbary pirates, you know, satraps to the Sultan, the Ottoman uh, Ottoman Empire, you know, preyed on Christian. Shipping, Christian shipping was fair game, and the European powers generally just paid tribute to uh, you know to the 
to, to these Muslim corsairs or these you know Islamic pirates in, in North Africa. Now the American spirit, the Americans were frontiersmen. They were, they were in many cases pioneers. These were some rough dudes, as they, you would have said in in, in my native Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, and the, the, militarily the United States was not, was not much you know compared to the European powers, but the spirit of early 19th century America when Jefferson was president was encapsulated in that great line, millions for defense, not a penny for tribute. Why is, what a great country this used to be. Millions for defense, not a penny for tribute. It's under, under President Thomas Jefferson, the United States Navy was founded. The Marine Corps, Marines, you know, warriors at sea, the Marines, well, you know, the the warriors on the U.S. Navy, uh, Navy vessels, and they took on the Barbary pirates, you know, from the shores of Tripoli to the from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Right? My students have no idea what that means, but the halls of Montezuma is, refers to the Mexican War, the shores of Tripoli to the war against the Barbary pirates when Thomas Jefferson was was president, and they fought these Barbary pirates to at least a standstill, and, and perhaps won some, you know, I think won some naval victories there. But you know the, the the United States was starting to, to flex its muscles in defense of individual rights. They didn't use the navy to you know to to prey on on you know merchant vessels or to attack innocent people. They went after the bad guys who were initiating force against you know innocent merchant vessels. And here's Thomas Jefferson again recognizing that the proper role of government is to protect individual rights. And again. You know, we, we salute Thomas Jefferson. And I, I could say, I think if Jefferson were alive today, uh, he might be proud. The U.S. Navy is truly a power for, for peace in the world. By far the most powerful Navy, you know, in the world. The deep water, blue water Navy all over the world with those submarine, you know, submarines with the you know, capacity to fire Trident missiles, you know, from thousands of miles away they're untrackable keeps bad guys at bay you don't want to attack the united states because the u.s navy can hammer you and you won't even know where the missiles and nuclear warheads are you know are coming from and president thomas jefferson initiated that he might be proud if he was alive today i think he'd be proud of the way the navy that he established you know helped win world war ii uh and both Yo, know, theaters in the Pacific and and in, in in Europe, and is a powerful force for defending for, you know liberty as much as we have in the in the in the country anymore. It's a powerful force for that. And again, you see Je Jefferson's recognition: the proper role of government is to defend individual rights. You see it here in a in a military you know slash naval context. Again, another you know tribute to Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, I would I would hate to end on a downer, but I also just want to point out though that Jefferson somewhat abandoned this principle and in, in 1805 William Eaton led a band of mercenaries and marines across the desert to attack the uh, the Tripolitan capital of Derna and in, in this instance I think if they had continued the fight they could have taken the capital and basically won won the war hands down but Jefferson decided in this case to pay a sixty thousand dollar ransom and, and, and that sort of forfeited this principle that he stood for of, of not paying them. He, you know, they called it ransom as opposed to, to tribute because that would have been even more of a PR disaster. But then in 1816, the second Barbary Wars breaks out because America did not have a definitive victory. And Madison, who, who I think does a better job of sticking to Jefferson's original principles, wins a decisive and lasting victory in that war. And um, so, I mean, there are a few, you know, we didn't discuss much about Jefferson's presidency and probably we ought to because, you know, there's also the, the Louisiana Purchase and then there's mm -hmm. the uh, situation with the French and English naval attacks on American, American shipping. There's just so much that we, we probably can't cover him in, in one show. But, um, you know, there, this is definitely a, a part of his presidency. And I think some of these are reasons that, that Jefferson uh, doesn't include being the president of the United States on his tombstone. It's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, Declaration of Independence, Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and the University of Virginia, which we also won't have time to talk about today, but um, that leaves out president of the United States and, uh, and several right. other accomplishments. But, but you know, right. there are 
plenty of reasons to look at Jefferson's presidency and to, you know, sort of uh, uh, scratch one's head and be a bit down about them. But, um, you know, on yeah, the we, whole, you, Jefferson I guess he is, is yeah. uh, one of, of individual rights, like we've been saying, of, of individualism. And, and maybe we should do a second show on Jefferson yeah, at some I was, point. I, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Let's do a show on, on Jefferson's presidency. We did that with, with George Washington. We, dis, we could discuss the presidency, the Louisiana Purchase, the Lewis and Clark expedition. You know, we could discuss his, his founding the Library of Congress. We, you know, the, at least one, the second, the second iteration of the Library of Congress with his own personal book collection. We could discuss founding the University of Virginia and designing some of that campus. Right? Didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he design yeah. some of the campus down in Charlottesville? And so there's the the relationship with John Adams, the the car you know, the, the the way that they were they were close, then it fell apart because in large part because of Jefferson's duplicity, which we would need to discuss, but they rekindled their relationship by correspondence, brilliant correspondence for years, died on the same day on July fourth in eighteen twenty six. You can't make this stuff up, you you know. Um so yeah, I think we should definitely do a second show on Jefferson on the Jefferson presidency and and the the aftermath, the rest the, and the rest of his life, which is which is notable in and of itself. But I think we've we've done enough today to show that you know these um, these misguided uh, fools is too you know too weak a word. But these these misguided people on the on the political left today cancel culture. They're wrong in general, and they're absolutely wrong about Thomas Jefferson fundamentally. We, you know, we have to acknowledge his flaws, criticize his flaws, but he is a giant, absolute giant. We have to salute the great man, John. We have to salute Thomas Jefferson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. And oh, I should say thank you, Mr. President, for your enormous contributions to, you know, the positive contributions to the United States and to, and, and to world history. And so, John and everybody out there in hero land, I want to wish you to have a more heroic day and have a heroic weekend, everybody. You too, Eddie.